What's up, everybody? Welcome back to CWI Summer Conference here at Gaysburg College. I'm joined by Dr. James Brumall, my good friend from Shepherd University, director of the George Tyler Moore Center for the Study of the Civil War. Thanks for being on the live stream, my friend. I appreciate it, John. Um, as always, uh, always interested in what you're doing and um, very happy to be at CWI. So it's, yeah. it's a good combination. <laughs> Yeah, Jim's always been a big supporter of what we've been doing and what we've been trying to do for you all to bring you more history digitally and live streams and podcasts and all that. You probably heard about the fall uh, semester, Civil War semester, on the podcast. Uh, and uh, it was just great to have Jim along for the ride for some of our live streams that we've done. So uh, we want to talk about what you talked about here today. And I want to plug your book, obviously because that's what I do. Uh, Private Confederacies, The Emotional Worlds of Southern Men as Citizens and Soldiers. Awesome book. I still need to do a review of it. I'm sorry. As long as it's positive. That's the, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, for 20 bucks, I'll, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, today, you, you talked about uh, the emotional landscapes of the Gaysburg Battlefield. How'd that talk go? Uh, yeah, so um, in the center, center of the book, uh, I, I deal with the concept of battle somewhat of an, as an abstraction. And so um, I, I filter it largely through the lens of the Pennsylvania campaign, but I'm interested more broadly in how soldiers are responding to the experience of war and more importantly, how they're comprehending the scale of death and carnage. Hmm. Um, and so uh, what I tried to do today and what I do more broadly in the book is I, I chart kind of changing emotions over time. So how expressions shift over time. And so for instance, in 1861, we see, as you might expect, a great deal of bravado among many of the raw recruits. Um, one of the men that I talk about, I talked about today, and I talk about in the book, Leonidas Torrance, who fought here at Gettysburg on July the first, where he's severely wounded and dies days later. He's in the 23rd North Carolina in 1861. He writes to his family, "I'm ready for a fight. The men won't go home until they've gone into battle." Well, he actually sees battle finally on the peninsula in um, late May and early June of 1862. He survives that battle, he survives those fights. He talks about being nipped by a ball on his coat. He starts to waver. He has seen, um, seen the elephant, as they say. There's still a great deal of certitude in the way he's writing. There's still a great deal of control in the content of his letters. But then he goes to Chancellorsville. And I think um, he doesn't become unhinged, but he becomes profoundly shaken. And so he composes a remarkable letter to his mother on May the 7th, 1863 in which he surveys the landscape for her. And he talks about the bodies that um, unfortunately uh, had caught fire. He talks about the men's profound suffering on, on the field. And he describes these sites as profoundly distressing. He has seen enough of war. Um, and so for me, there's this remarkable shift that occurs in his correspondence home. And it becomes a lot more unvarnished, a lot more kind of authentic, if you want to use that term, a lot more real. And um, eventually, his last words home won't come from his pen, but instead from his comrade, W.J. O'Daniel. Mm. O'Daniel is a messmate, a comrade of Torrance. Again, they're finding the 23rd North Carolina part of Iverson's brigade. They see action on the north end of the field near Oak Ridge. They're caught entirely off guard because Iverson didn't really properly deploy skirmishers. And um, opposed to them are Union troops behind a stone wall. And when they rise up, um, Baxter's men, they just level these North Carolinians. Torrance is hit both in the head and the thigh. And so the last letter that he's going to compose home, of course, is not by his hand, but his friend. And he says that he's willing to die, that he's comfortable um, knowing his fate. And that to me is this remarkable moment of intimacy between two comrades. And then as, as O'Daniel closes his letter, he says, you have no idea how badly I hated to leave Lawn. And that's what he called mm -hmm. his friend. And so basically today over the course of the, the talk, I try to chart some of this emotional um, some of this emotional language, these expressions the soldiers are offering in their letters home, and gain us to think more about kind of change over time and how soldiers' representations of the conflict are going to shift. Um, the other example I gave, if we can talk about it briefly at least, is that of John Warwick Daniel. He's a major serving with Jubal Early. He comes down on July the 1st, doesn't see action. So what he sees instead is the carnage of the first day's battlefield. And so in, he does this interesting survey of the battlefield, and he talks about, again, the blasted landscapes. He talks about the Union soldiers who have perished. He has a great deal of kind of ambivalence as he's confronting this, this battlescape. He's, he's, he's both horrified by it, 
and almost kind of compelled by it because, of course, on the end of July the 1st, the Confederates have achieved a monumental victory. It, it's ultimately um, chimerical because, of course, on the 3rd they meet defeat. But Daniel's da uh, balancing all these different feelings over the course of his um, account. Yet in 1875, he has a published account of the battle that he used as a foundation, that 1863 account. All the, cer all the uncertainty, all the wavering, all the ambivalence is entirely gone. There's a great deal of certitude. And as he talks about the first day's field, for instance, he calls it kind of a glorious panorama of battle. He doesn't mm. talk about the vanquished. He doesn't talk about the dead and the dying. He instead talks about the great friends and brothers who are there doing um, feats comparable to the days of antiquity. And so it's this remarkable control that he seizes upon and this degree of power that he asserts in his narrative and whatever kind of emotional uncertainty that he had experienced in his 1863-64 account, because I'm not entirely sure when he wrote it, mm -hmm. it's erased entirely in 1875 publicly. Mm -hmm. But privately, he's still a feeling man who, who, who still wavers, who still feels, I think, ambivalence about the war, um, but he's, he's, he's mounted this very specific public persona. So those are some of the arcs, so the narrative arcs I tried to, to talk about today, and I'm a big um, believer in the use of primary source materials, as, right. as you and I have seen in the past. Right. And so I tried to bring in some of the letters, and I think that's one of the most effective ways to connect audiences to the past, is to get them reading the, the, the words, the letters of um, Civil War soldiers, civilians, and slaves. That's the way in which you can communicate most effectively with the past, is, is, is to go back to the source materials mm -hmm. and then start making right. your own um, judgments and starting to interact with the sources on your own terms. Right, it, it's such an interesting thing because we, we talked about earlier on our live stream about the differences between looking at a memoir and looking at the letter written at the time or close to the time that the event occurred. It's two totally different things and a lot of people who, uh, maybe are just getting into the history field or maybe just curious or whatever, may not see that yet. Yes, I think a, a lot of us, our, fo our first exposure to kind of like common soldier studies, for instance, might be something like Hardtack and Coffee by Dwight Billings. It's John Billings. John, John Billings. John Billings. Thank That's you. okay. I need you here for a fact check. <laughs> uh, the John Billings um, famed 1880s account. Right. Um, and, and, and Billings, of course, goes through uh, daily life of the soldier, and so there's a lot in there that I think you know recalls his experiences rather well. But we have to be careful with any sort of memoir because it's written in some cases decades after the fact. They're starting to order the events of the wartime era into very specific narratives. They're starting to lend meaning to these narratives, and um, in some cases they're advancing um, political narratives um, through their their memoirs, and so. We can't take those at face value, yet for many of us, that's our, our earliest entry in the source materials. Now, Pete's the aberration, of course, because as we learned at this conference, as a high school student, he was visiting the archives. <laughs> I, I right. wasn't doing that as a high schooler. I was probably doing what most high schoolers are doing. But Pete was right there immersed in the primary source materials at age 16, um, which yes. is why he's here today as the director of CWI. Yes. Um, but <laughs> you're absolutely right. Uh, they're, they're, they're the ones that are the most commonly reprinted today. They're the ones that, that provide us narratives, I think, um, make sense of the conflict, so we as readers like them. Mm -hmm. But we'd be better served, of course, by going back to the, in some cases, the printed primaries in the University of Tennessee, the University of South Carolina, and University of North Carolina Presses have each done a great job mm -hmm. in, in doing some of these printed primaries. And they enable us to see the, the war from, from the soldier's perspective, from the view from the ground, mm -hmm. and that narrative is often disconnected, contradictory, disjointed, and that's why, of course, historians can try and make sense of that. But um, I actually haven't done much with memoirs. I was always kind of taught to be very careful with them as evidence, and I had done a talk a couple weeks ago on Daniel. I was only using his wartime materials, and I had forgotten about this 1875 account, and I started to wonder, like, how much does that compare to the one that he wrote during the war. Mm -hmm. And so I, I thought, well, I had an opportunity here to present it, and I, I thought I would. And I, I think it's just absolutely fascinating. Again, it's not terribly surprising that he does that, but again, it was, it was, it was fascinating, especially because I could, in that instance, chart change over time. A lot right. of times, like with Billings, we might only have the memoir. We might only have the post-war writings. Right. But in this instance, I had a wartime body of evidence that I could juxtapose against a post-war. And I could mm -hmm. see how mm -hmm. he himself was starting to lend different meaning to these events, how he himself was starting to change the narrative, how he himself was draining from that post-war account all the blood, 
and um, all the ambiguity and all the uncertainty and how he had transformed transformed this account into a relatively tidy narrative of the conflict. And that right. to me was a really interesting possibility. Right. And you can, you can also see from the two, you can also see the audience that that was supposed to yep. go to. There are two different audiences. That's exactly right. And the, 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 the wartime one I don't think was ever intended for public consumption. The post-war one is at the height of lost cause mythology, is at the height of the era of reconciliation, of which Daniel was a proponent. And he himself um, was what Pete calls part of the last generation of Virginia slaveholders, so this group of young intellectual Virginians who spearhead the charge in the post-war era for economic growth and development. And so Daniel has lots of different political reasons, economic reasons, social reasons to um, create the narrative that he creates. And for him, he really wanted uh, the Southern martyrs of Gettysburg to become American heroes. That was very important for him. And so the language has a very specific use um, for his kind of political and social agendas. And so you're right, the audiences had, had shifted radically. And he needed also the story of Virginians in the Civil War in some ways to become an American story because he needed the help of, of northern income, nor the influx of northern capital to kind of help transform the South's economy. And so there's a, a host of different reasons why he, I think, offers the address. Now, this particular address was offered to veterans, so it's a pretty sympathetic audience, um, specifically members of the Army of Northern Virginia. But it, it was published, and I think it you know, didn't receive widespread circulation, but was certainly read by lots of different communities, mm -hmm. and so that's very telling to me. The, the one thing that you said that, that is telling for me is how uh, the attitudes towards the first day's battlefield changed, and it's almost like it's going back to the order of the good death on that one, the nice, clean yeah. battlefield look of its glory and, and all that. What, what's interesting, and um, it says that you read my mind, so um, <laughs> in, in the Daniel account, he talks about the debris, he talks about billowing smoke, he talks about, as he says, the grotesque all-white eye turned back into socket, but what he spends the most amount of time on is a dead Union artilleryman. And the reason why is because the man has died and he looks as though he's asleep. As Daniel says in his accounts, there's no blood on his clothes. The bullet had done its work, but left no impression upon the body. The countenance um, was calm, and again, he looked as though he was sleeping. He embodied the good death. He embodied um, the, that Victorian ideal. And so Daniel was compelled by that, even his, in his original first day account, he's drawn to that scene. This is someone who had uh, you know, a, a, attended university. He eventually becomes a lawyer, um, trained at UVA in the post-war period. And so he's very well versed in Victorian terminology, a Victorian worldview. He's probably familiar with the King James Bible, perhaps even, well, I know he's familiar with Shakespeare from some of his pre-war writings. And so, um, yeah, so he's very drawn <laughs> yeah. to that. that particular. But then he right. says in the account, he goes, ah, but I must sigh and go on and go join the celebrations um, that are going on in town. But again, even in the post-war account, that man is, is removed, that artilleryman that he spent so much time on in the wartime account is removed entirely. Mm -hmm. And instead, he's talking again about the living, not the dead, which I thought was so telling. Right. And what's interesting, right. too, if you want to layer this even more, he has this great account from 1859 called an, an oration on the illustrious dead that he delivers mm -hmm. before Lynch, Lynchburg College. And he says it's the duty of every citizen to become a soldier and to join the great statesmen um, and the great politicians, but the great soldiers who have perished in war. That's 1859. Right. He's concentrating in 1859 on the dead. After he sees battle, after he sees war, in 1875, he concentrates on the living. He still has mm. meditations on the dead, as most of these post-war accounts do. Mm. But again, when he's populating the battlefield, he's populating it with the living, with the soldiers who are pressing on mm. um, to, to um, the, the, the heights beyond town um, mm. on, as the evening draws on July the 1st. Is that turn in mentality a common occurrence in, in primary source materials, or is that rare to find something like that? I think that... It's rare insofar as to say his, his, his narrative arc is so complete. So okay. when, when I started right. this book, I had these very ambitious ideas that I was going to be able to chart a series of men from the 1840s to the 1880s. I was going to find really clean correspondence. I could chart change over time. And why I believed that is because I found at UNC, University of North Carolina, Southern Historical Collection, a five-volume journal by a William, I'm sorry, George Anderson Mercer, and I start. I use Mercer throughout the book, but I was like, ah, well, here's Mercer. I can chart him from the age of 13 to the day he dies, basically. 
okay, so this yeah. is a narrative arc that's very enticing, and I just assumed, foolishly, <laughs> that there would be dozens <laughs> of these sources out there. Well, there weren't. Um, right. What happens during the wartime era is that men who are disinclined to write, write for the first time because they're away from their lives, their wives, their children, their loved ones, they need to write to maintain those linkages back home. Yeah. But when they rejoin with their families in the post-war era, the correspondence cuts off. So I have so many collections that stopped in 65, right. never to be renew renewed again with any sort of vigor. Um, so Daniel is interesting because I had to piece it together from several different archives, part of his collections at the University of Virginia, part of his collections at the Virginia Historical Society, part of his collection is, is in the public purview, part of his, um, uh, part of his correspondence has been published. Mm -hmm. And so when you piece it all together, you have this amazing narrative arc um, that isn't unparalleled, but is unusual. Mm -hmm. I think though what he's representing, what he's talking about is pretty common. I think that, that a lot of men experience these changes. I tended not to focus in on that in the book because I was really interested in, in private lies. Um, I have a lot of public episodes, but I was really interested in private correspondence that continued anguish and traumas the soldiers express in their letters home for instance in the or sorry letters to friends in the 1870s and 80s um so i didn't focus so much on memoirs like daniel's um but i think it's, it's a narrative arc that makes a lot of sense and resonate would resonate for people who've read similar collections mm -hmm. yeah. now tomorrow we're going on a great battlefield hike we are together I'm, I'm potentially gonna, under thunderstorms. Potentially, yes, yes, which is going to hurt the live stream capabilities right. of what I'm supposed to be right. doing tomorrow, yeah, according a, to Dr. Carmichael. Yeah, bring a hoodie, <laughs> a rain suit, an umbrella. I'll get little. one of those hats with the umbrella on top. Yeah, you're going to need a work. lot tomorrow. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think yeah. so. Uh, but we're, we're going to Antietam tomorrow, mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully it won't be too much of a soggy mess. Uh, what are we going to experience tomorrow on the battlefield? So Pete, uh, in many ways, Pierre Carmichael uh, is the one that had the idea for the tour. And, um, you know, we both spend a lot of time on these battlefields giving not traditional tours, I think, but um, I think there's a standard tour that many audiences want and deserve, especially if they're coming to Gettysburg once in a decade or once in a lifetime or Antietam once in a lifetime. They, they need to know, I think, a lot of the arc of the battle itself. CWI is composed of literally hundreds of, of men, women um, of various ages and backgrounds who have had a lot of exposure to, I think, both of these battlefields, Antietam and Gettysburg. And so the challenge for someone like Pete, I think, is to think about new ways for them to think about these sites. One mechanism that, that they deploy here very often, which is very effective, you follow one regiment. So in the regiment's footsteps, you can probably learn a great deal they probably didn't know in a microcosm about a broader section of battle. Pete wants to do, and what we're going to do uh, tomorrow, is go through the north end of the field, the west woods, and the sunken road through the perspectives of multiple soldiers. And in each instance, we're going to bring a source or sources to the site, the exact place that the soldiers walked across, the fields that they walked across, the fields that they fought in. We're going to bring you there to that spot. We're going to bring out the source materials, and we're going to pick specific sections in which they are going to illuminate certain themes. And so, for instance, um, I will talk about on the evening of September the 16th, 1862, a very famous um, man from Massachusetts, Robert Gould Shaw, who of course is featured in the movie Glory, um, his letter collection, Blue Eye Child of Fortune, is just an exquisite collection of his letters home. On the 16th, Shaw at this time, of course, is a relatively unknown officer mm -hmm. in the second Massachusetts, he talks about what he thinks is going to be a final conversation with one of his friends at a campfire. So it's two men, two officers, bivouacked on the field of battle. They know the battle is coming. They've already skirmished, not he, but the Union of Confederate Forces have skirmished on the evening of the 16th. They're sharing letters. They're talking about last, potentially last moments together. Wow. So that's one entry point. As we're walking towards the West Woods, we're going to walk across the clover field historically and the cornfield historically, over which the 2nd Massachusetts walked. Shaw is somewhat engaged in the battle, but then he turns around and he sees this horrific battlescape. So we're going to talk about that. Pete's going to extract a letter from a soldier in the 20th Mass whose officer becomes entirely unhinged by the battle. Keith Bohannon's going to expose us to some of the Georgians who fought in the West Woods. My point here is that in each instance, we're going to try to bring the themes of anticipation, courage versus cowardice. Um, uncertainty. We're going to try to extract these themes from these letters and then 
place that theme on this specific part of the battlefield. So we're trying to expose audiences to these fields in different ways, and our hope is, of course, that they come back to these amazing national parks as visitors, and then they rethink some old assumptions, or they look at the ground in a new way. And I think there's a world of possibilities by exposing audiences to source materials to do just that. And to me, the most important connections that we can make um, as historians, as public historians, is when we do go to these battlefields and we do bring audiences to these spots and then bring the words of the participants to them as they saw it unfold. I mean, Antium is a remarkable field where you can look at a pretty famous account like Rufus Dawes and follow the advance of the Iron Brigade, and that landscape is more or less restored slash rehabilitated by the National Park Service. You can see more or less the Virginia snake fence that he goes up against. You can see in the right season the cornfield over which he charges. You can border the Hagerstown Turnpike that now has the proper six rail fence and you can do all these right. different things and so that's what we're going to do tomorrow. Right. I've, I've Just so you know I've gotten so much feedback from people who are here uh, about our Culp's Hill tour that we oh. were on and they've come up to me and I was just like a sponsor standing off the side and, and thanked me for the tour and I'm like you need to thank the guys who actually put the tour on because you brought the you brought the primary source materials out and and allowed them to connect in that in that position yeah I um I, I mean you should be thanked of course they would, you, you did your your fair share I just I just held up photos well, that's, that's <laughs> heavy that's, you know they can be heavy cumbersome yeah. <laughs> I, I think um that's something of which I was very proud I think it, it you know I was very happy that it went the way it did and I'm flattered and humbled of course the audiences got something out of that day but I think what made that day so effective is it was a very compelling story it's the story of course of John and Charlie Futch of the third North Carolina we have the letters that John wrote home. Well, John did not write home, actually. Of course, we know that he um, leaned upon a messmate, an officer in one case, to write these letters. Um, Stephen Berry just had an incredible talk about these types of voices earlier here at the conference. And I think audiences are, are compelled because we were on the ground over which these men had, had, had traveled. We were on the ground where Charlie was hit in the head with a mini ball. And it's a connection that I think uh, is not, it can't be anything but moving. Right. You can read about it in the books, of course, but going to the sites elevates that narrative in ways that is just per, are profoundly compelling. And that's why I believe so much, again, in the work of public historians, in the work of the National Park Service, in the, in the work of state and regional parks, because these resources are absolute necessities. Audiences right. must go to these sites, I think, to truly understand. Um, uh, the Civil War era, if they're, if they're students of it, you have to go to the sites. And in the ideal circumstances, that involves more than just guided tours. It involves the source materials. Right. And, and get out of your car and walk a little bit because if, if, that makes so much more sense to me to walk that ground and feel that ground and how, how it rolls and undulates because it go, connects with that primary source. Yeah. If, if health and ability allows right. for it, I think that it, it's an absolute necessity. And um, it's not only good for you uh, to get out and walk, to get right. your steps. So we know that now. Um, <laughs> but it enables you to see the ground in a different way. And I, I, I know we're. I'm getting towards the, the dinner call here, but I, I just a real quick anecdote. Yeah. I have been to Gettysburg, I think at this point it's probably been thousands of times. And you know, it was only when I did a really long bike trip into town did I really understand Buford's lines and mm -hmm. how undulating that terrain is. I understood Hers Ridge, I understood uh, McPherson's Ridge because of course they're the ones that you often walk over, but mm -hmm. you know, he had thrown skirmishers out much further. Mm -hmm on bike, not on foot, because it's several <laughs> miles, but on bike, you could fully understand. And the same is true on foot. Walk from um, uh, McPherson's Ridge to Seminary Ridge. Walk that ground. Mm -hmm. Walk from Willoughby Run up to the height where the Iron Brigade was. Understand how steep that terrain is, how steep that elevation is. Understand the, 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 the width of Willoughby Run, and it, it changes your perspective. The accounts begin to make sense. Right. And I think you look at the battlefields in very different ways. The National Park has the road system because, of course, they need it, and it's a good way for us to see elements of the battlefield. But you know, I would urge audiences, again, if health and ability allow, pull over in the parking and get out and walk and, and, and change your perspective. Tomorrow, as we, we travel across Antietam, the topography is going to matter so much because of mm -hmm. what was masked and obscured mm -hmm. to those Union troops who were assaulting Lee's line. Right. That battlefield is, is so deceptive because it feels right. so manageable and small in some ways, especially from the visitor center and the Dunker Church Plateau. But you walk 60 yards in one direction, 
and you can't see anything on your front. And, and actions like the West Woods all of a sudden make a lot more sense because of what they could not see before mm -hmm. them. And so again, yeah, I would, I would always encourage that. And um, I'm a huge advocate for, for kind of long battlefield walks and hikes. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to plug the book one more time so everyone knows. Uh, Private Confederacies, the Emotional Worlds of Southern Men as Citizens and Soldiers. And like I said, I'm going to post a link so you all have a way to get to it right away and order it. Uh, but thank you for your yeah, time, Jim, you, as, as yeah. always. Yeah, it's always good it, to be with you, my friend. Okay, take and care. And I'll see you tomorrow, obviously. Yeah. And you all be tuning in tomorrow, hopefully, if the weather holds out, to, to some live stream stuff from Antietam. So have a great evening, everybody. Thank you.